Welcome to the Aspen Institute's Murdoch Mind, Body, Spirit series program entitled The How of Happiness, featuring Sonia Lubomirsky in conversation with John Tierney. I'm Crystal Logan, Vice President of Aspen Community Programs and Engagement here at the Aspen Institute. And I first want to thank Jerry and Gina Murdoch for making this series possible. Thanks to our audience for tuning in for this important conversation. As I introduce our guests today, you'll find links to their bios in the chat, as well as other important information throughout the event. If you'd like to pose a question to our speakers today, you can type those into the Q&A feature anytime during the event. Sonia Lubomirsky is a distinguished professor of psychology at the University of California, Riverside. She's a leading and award-winning researcher in the field of positive psychology and is the author of The How of Happiness and The Myths of Happiness. She received her AB summa cum laude uh, from Harvard and her PhD in social psychology from Stanford. Our moderator today is John Tierney, a contributing editor at the City Journal uh, and a contributing science columnist at the New York Times. He is the co-author of The Power of Bad, How the Negativity Effect Rules Us and How We Can Rule It. He and his co-author, the social psychologist Roy F. Baumeister, also wrote Willpower, Rediscovering the Greatest Human Strength. We are thrilled and honored to feature you both here today. Uh, and with that, over to you, John. Thank you. Thanks very much, Crystal. And thanks very much to the Aspen Institute for, uh, for sponsoring the symposium on such an important topic. And it's a topic that has, really been, has been neglected for far too long. Um, in my book with Ray Baumeister, The Power of Bad, uh, we looked at why the brain focuses so much on the negative and, and bad events. And one of the big examples that we used of this negativity bias was in the psychological profession itself. That during the 20th century, psychology textbooks and journals devoted twice as much space to bad stuff, to neuroses, psychoses, traumas, than to ways to make people happier and, and improve people's well-being. And fortunately, that has changed recently in the past couple of decades since, since um, uh, Marty Seligman launched the positive psychology movement. It, it spawned a great deal of research. And Marty would be very happy to tell you that Sonia is one of the brightest lights in that movement. You know, she has, um, you know, she has, she has done so many groundbreaking experiments and studies. Her work has been cited over uh, 50,000 times. She's won the prestigious Diener Award, and she is just a favorite of journalists because her work is so interesting and she's so smart and, and, uh, and about these topics that, uh, that matter so much to, to us. You know, I'm one of the, of the many journalists who has been covering her work for decades, and I'm really thrilled to get a chance to talk to her today. Um, also, uh, I want to start with one of the older debates in, in psychology, and, and Sonia addresses this in, in her book, The How of Happiness, um, which is, can we really become happier? You know, th there was a belief for a long time that we're stuck on, on the so-called hedonic treadmill, that no matter what happens to us, good or bad, we tend to just get back to the same level. That we might have a brief change, but, but we have this sort of set point of happiness. And, that there was a famous study that the journalists loved to quote from the 1970s about lottery winners. And, and, and the study supposedly showed that the winning the lottery didn't make you any happier. In fact, it didn't even make you happier than somebody who'd been in a terrible accident and was paralyzed. And this seemed to be, you know, that was the evidence for this great treadmill that we're stuck. Fortunately, though, that wasn't really a very serious study. It didn't really track the winners. And um, and later some researchers actually did track some lottery winners and the good news was actually that winning the lottery did make them happier. You know, two years later, they were a bit happier and, and, and it also, and there was also research showing that being in a terrible accident can make you um, less happy. So we can affect our happiness, but, but as Sonia has shown so well in, in, in the how of happiness, most of us don't realize what makes us happy and, and what doesn't. And you've got a great um, pie chart in that book, Sonia, um, 
a pie chart showing what influences happiness. I wonder if you could start by explaining that. Sure. And hi, John. It's so great to talk mm -hmm. to you. And I, I, I think I remember meeting you years ago at a <laughs> social psychology conference. Um, so it's funny that you mentioned the lottery winner study because when I was in grad school, I just last year celebrated the 30th anniversary of doing research on happiness. 19, we, we started, I started as a first year graduate student in 1989. And that was, I remember reading that study. That was the first thing I read. Um, it's been kind of widely misinterpreted, I think. Uh, but the idea, I guess, back then is that there was a lot of pessimism about whether you can actually improve happiness. Because the idea was that, first of all, there's evidence that uh, there are really powerful genetic influences on happiness. And that's true. I mean, there are genetic influences on happiness. Any of us who have children know that, you know, some of them are really happy, others are less happy, even though you seem to raise them in a similar environment. Um, and, uh, and then hedonic adaptation plays a really big role. Actually, one of my books, The Myths of Happiness, is all about that. So hedonic ad adaptation or the hedonic treadmill is this idea that human beings are remarkably good at getting used to changes in their lives, right? So something really good happens to us. We win the lottery. We get married. We buy a new house. We buy a new pair of shoes. We first get really happy, but then that happiness doesn't last forever. We kind of go back to our baseline. Same thing with negative events. I mean, it's good for negative events to have adaptation, right? So we, we, lose, we lose our job, we uh, get divorced, uh, we have a, um, you know, some kind of something negative happen and we tend to adapt, not to everything. So it turns out actually major disability is something that we never completely adapt to on average. But anyway, so yeah, the question of like, can we become happier? And I, you know, I guess I wouldn't be here if I didn't think the answer was, was no. Um, we can become happier, but it takes a lot of work. It's, it's like with anything in life, with any kind of goal. If you want to be a better you know, gardener, a better chef, a better father, you know, a better accountant, you have to work at it. Um, and you have to create new habits uh, that, that can sort of maintain that happiness. And so much of my career has been sort of devoted to sort of what kinds of behaviors or strategies or habits can people develop to sort of increase their happiness and to maintain that increase. Um, you talk about the 40% solution because you say that about 50% sure. is genetic. Could you explain that? And well, you know, I, I will, but I will and I won't because, uh, <laughs> so the pie chart, okay, so in my book, The How of Happiness, there was a, a, a pie on the cover. And so the pie chart is something my colleagues, Ken Sheldon and David Shkadi and I described in a, in a paper from a long time ago, where we claim that about 50% of individual differences in happiness are accounted for by genetics, about 10% by life circumstances, like how much money you have or whether you're married or how old you are. And then the rest is about 40% by kind of what you do, kind of the strategies that you use in your daily life, how you behave and how you think. Now, I, I, for, for years since then, we actually did, 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 not, did not kind of regretted um, putting those hard numbers out there mm -hmm. because people took them too seriously and they also misinterpreted them. So it's not 40% of your happiness that's under your control, it's 40% accounted for by sort of a population happiness. Mm -hmm. And those three factors influence each other, right? So your genetics and your life circumstances and how you act, they all kind of interact and, and are interdependent. So I guess the bottom line, I have a new paper actually where we kind of explain what we really were thinking and how we think now. But I guess the bottom line is don't think about the numbers, like forget about the numbers and just think that there are these three buckets, right? That contribute mm -hmm. to happiness. One bucket is genetics. One bucket is your life circumstances. And by the way, if your circumstances are really bad, if you, live, if you live in a war zone in Syria, or if you're poor, or if you're in an abusive relationship, then that's going to be like 95% contribution to your happiness, not 10%. Mm -hmm. And then this third bucket is like how you think and how you behave in your daily life. That also contributes to happiness. So forget about the numbers, but think about them as sort of three different buckets. Okay. And um, now you talk about that that portion that we can control by what we do. You know, uh, we can't control our genes, we can't control our circumstances that well. I mean, uh, to some extent, but, we, but, there, but that still leaves a lot that we can do. And you talk about um, happiness strategies. And, and one thing that I love about the book is that you've got this, before you present the strategies, you've got this questionnaire for people to do and say, what kind of strategies would work for you? What kind of things are gonna, are gonna work um, individually for you? And you fill that out and then you get, these strategies. So you want to talk about some of the strategies and, and I mean, some examples of them and also how they suit different kinds of people. 
Yeah, I mean, thank you for bringing up that idea of fit, because I guess a lot of uh, previous sort of self-help books about happiness were, were kind of like, you should do this to be happy, and you, or you should do that to be happy. You should count your blessings, um, or you should meditate. And it turns out that those, those kinds of, that, that advice doesn't work for everyone. So I think it's really important to find the strategy that fits your personality or your lifestyle or your values or your goals, or your culture, because not everything, for example, like is successful in every culture. Um, and so that's why I like people to sort of think about do you, the kind of the shortcut for this fit measure is, do you think this strategy, let's say counting your blessings, which, which has been shown to increase happiness. And we've done, we, my lab has done some studies on that. Would you think about counting your blessings? Is that something that you think you would enjoy doing? Do you think it would be meaningful to you to do? Do you think you, you, you would feel natural doing it? And for some people, the answer is no. And I'm one of those people. I think counting blessings is really hokey and trite. And I don't do that. But that's fine because there's other ways of expressing gratitude. And there's other strategies uh, that we can use. So the strategies that there's probably a hundred or hundreds of behaviors or kind of ways of thinking that we can implement to be happier. Scientists have only studied some of them because we don't have time to test all the hundreds. My lab focuses on gratitude and kindness and connection or social social behavior mm -hmm. so being more social being more extroverted uh doing more acts of kindness being more pro-social and expressing gratitude those are kind of the three types of strategies that we tend to focus on that we've been testing mm -hmm. we do what are what, what i call happiness interventions mm -hmm. uh, which are they're kind of like clinical trials everyone now is familiar with clinical trials right so clinical trials might test uh, whether a treatment works whether a vaccine works and it has a control group or several control groups and we follow people across time. We do the same kind of thing, except instead of testing a vaccine, we're testing, does expressing gratitude in a particular way make people happy relative to a, some kind of neutral or control activity? Mm -hmm. Well, tell us about some of these experiments. Like you had one where people um, had to become more extroverted. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, one of my, my, my most favorite experiments, uh, um, we uh, asked people for one week, uh, try to act more extroverted. Now we didn't use the word extroverted because it has connotations. So we said, uh, we, we use the sort of the three key uh, terms associated with extroversion, um, sociable, try to be more sociable or talkative, more energetic and more assertive. So the, 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 those are the three facets, uh, main facets of extroversion. So for one week, people, participants acted more extroverted. And, this, and then after that, there was a week where they were asked to act more introverted or vice versa. And introverted was sort of more thoughtful, like sort of um, uh, yeah. strong, silent type. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we actually were really surprised by the findings. Um, we found that all of our, I mean, across the board, we actually got the, the biggest effect sizes, the biggest effects that we've ever gotten in any study where during the week that people were acted more extroverted, they, they showed huge boosts in positive emotions in, in meaning and flow and connection. And the week that people were asked to act more introverted, they actually had decreases in sort of all those positive things, decreases in happiness. And that was even true for the introverts. Because we thought that introverts, as we know, you know, Susan Cain has this beautiful book about introversion called Quiet, which I recommend to everyone. And she talks about how introverts are exhausted by it when they try to act sociable. They, they, they might enjoy it, but they come back from a party and they're exhausted, whereas the extroverts are energized. But even the introverts in our study had all these positive benefits. Now, granted, it was only a week long, so it's possible if it was a month or longer, then we would have different effects. But, and there's other studies that have uh, found consistent results. Although- so Do you advise that, everyone, even, you know, even us introverts, to, uh, to go out and be like the life of the party now? Or? Well, no, 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 no. First of all, there's a study that came out of University of Melbourne that did find uh, what's called a moderation effect by introversion, where, but where introverts benefited less. Mm -hmm. uh, so we need to replicate. But second, I think I need, to, I need to sort of point out, when we ask people to act more extroverted, it doesn't mean that they had to go out and be the life of the party. They could choose any way they want to just be a little bit more sociable, a little bit more energetic, a little bit more assertive. So it could just be maybe a certain moments during the day, maybe I would speak up a little bit more, you know, when I'm having lunch with friends or I'm chatting with the barista. I usually don't, but I, I might this time, right? So, so a little bit more sociability. It turns out that you know social interactions are really critical to happiness, and we find and others find that the more we have them, the happier we are, which is really, of course, challenging in these days when we're limited in our in our social interactions. Right. So, 
so that's that's one of the strategies uh, you talk about the the um, social uh, strengthening social connections. What are other ways to do that? Um, well, the, I think the strategy that we've done the most work on and maybe is, is one of the most powerful is doing acts of kindness for others, basically supporting other people, being generous and, and, and kind. Uh, we have lots of studies where we ask people in different ways, classic study, classic paradigm, we use paradigm sort of our, our, our procedure that we use is we ask people for the next month, do three more acts of kindness every week than you normally do, all in a single day. So let's say, today's Wednesday, every Thursday or every Monday for the next month, do three extra acts of kindness. Mm -hmm. And we find that makes people feel more connected, happier. We have a control group, we tend to have a control group where we ask people, uh, instead of do acts of kindness for others, do acts of kindness for yourself. So uh, something self-indulgent, like give yourself a treat, you know, buy yourself something nice to eat or have a massage or take a walk uh, in the sun. And we find that acts of kindness for yourself, it do, they, they don't increase your happiness sort of in a That spell. is so disappointing, you know? You know how many people be disappointed with that result? It's like the data, the, the study by Liz Dunn and others where they, they gave people $20 and they asked them to either to spend it on themselves or others. And people right. were happier when they spent the $20 on other people. Yeah, that's, uh, so, so those three acts of kindness, and you also found that timing mattered, I think, right? The, the, in some of these studies. Yeah, and de depending on the study, we, well, I like to think of this as dosage, right? We, again, getting back to clinical trials, you know, of drugs or vaccines, dosage is really important, right? And lots of work goes into determining the optimal dosage of a drug and also for individuals, right? Because sometimes you have, there's different dosages for different individuals. And so we look at the dosage, like what's the optimal dosage of acts of kindness? Can you be too kind? I would say yes, right? I mean, there we all know people who are just way too caring and giving and they neglect their own self-care or they're, they say yes too much and they might feel exploited or, or it's a burden on them, right? So you have to kind of look at dosage. With gratitude, I think it's really important to look at dosage. We did a study where we asked people to count their blessings either once a week or three times a week. And we found that those who counted their blessings three times a week did not actually increase in happiness. Mm -hmm. And it could be, we think it's because it was too much, you know, maybe it became a chore. Maybe you had trouble thinking of things to be grateful for, right? If you try to express gratitude too much, you're like, you think there's something, there's, there's a phenomenon in social psychology called the effort as information heuristic. And what it means is when it's hard for you to come up with a set of items like blessings, you actually take that as an indicator that maybe I'm not, my life is not so fortunate after all, right? I can't think of what to be grateful for. <laughs> We actually did another study where we varied how many blessings people had to count or had to list either two, what was it? Um, two, four, eight, 16, or 32. Mm -hmm. Okay, guess which one was the optimal number of blessings? Um, eight. Eight, <laughs> yes, exactly. So we're now replicating it and, and, and um, actually giving people kind of a random number. So, so dosage is really important. So in that case, what somebody should do um, is is make a list of eight blessings a week. Is that right then? And then do it once a week, ideally? Yeah, Maybe. ideally. But again, I mean, I want to stress, though, that the studies are just about averages. So on average, you know, eight blessings had the optimal yeah. effect in terms of increasing happiness or positive emotions. But for you, John, it could be something else. Or maybe you shouldn't count blessings at all because you find it kind of hokey, like I do. Um, I don't actually. Pack, um, your work inspired my family at Thanksgiving on the tablecloth. Um, everybody went around and wrote down something they were grateful for. And it was great to have that tablecloth and then, you know, and then the next year you have it too and you could see things. It really it made Thanksgiving great. But, but I, I, I can see why people, you know, the, you know this hokey problem um, in the, uh, um, your work inspired me to go back into the power of bad. We talk about Pollyanna and you call them happiness strategies. We call them glad games. And I went back and read the original Pollyanna novel where she comes up with the glad game and the interesting history of that to me was that um the actresses who played her the critics everybody hated you know they thought it was so hokey and so corny um and yet that the novels just stole you know they just went on selling the movies kept being hits and so and there's that paradox you talk about in your book that this stuff sounds so hokey and yet it, it works right exactly and you know and, and it, it, it's it's like a it's positivity right the power of positivity I mean, even going back to remember the secret 
which was so terrible, right? This idea that it was a huge bestseller, this idea that just by thinking of something that you want, it will sort of manifest itself and it'll kind of mm -hmm. come to you. Like the boy is thinking he wants a bicycle one day. Literally, there's a video about this. One day he opens the garage, there's a bicycle. It but, doesn't work. It doesn't sorry. work. <laughs> well, well, I think what, what it really was about was about the power of positive thinking. If you really, really want that job, you know, the idea is maybe you'll actually do something and you, you might appear more confident at the job interview and you might, uh, you might actually take steps to get to get to what you want. I mean, I, but the power of positive thinking is there, there's so much evidence that, that it can help, you know, in the right situation, sometimes you can be too positive. So, mm -hmm. um, so what are some strategies for positive thinking? That's what, you know, and, and some of these other strategies for people who want to figure out which one is right for them. Sure, sure. Well, by the way, positive thinking, I think of a big kind of umbrella term. So that would encompass, encompass, for example, gratitude. So that's a form of positive thinking because gratitude basically involves thinking about something good about your life as opposed to focusing on something bad or, or focusing on what you have as opposed to focusing on what you don't have. Um, and then optimism, which is really positive thinking about the future. Um, in terms of, I don't know if I have sort of advice like, like a therapist might, because I think it depends on the person. It's so individualized. So for some people, we, we've done, we did a study, for example, asking uh, younger people to imagine their life in the future in 10 years and imagine that all your dreams have come true. Mm -hmm. And 10 years is kind of a good period because it's long enough that it's sort of far off, but it's not too, too short, it's not too long. Um, and so basically we had, we had, we had student, uh, college students write about their dreams coming true. And so they felt, and that made them feel more optimistic and that made them happier. But one reason it turned out is a lot of them has told us they'd never really thought about their goals very much and how to get there. Mm -hmm. And so this kind of forced them to sort of think about the steps that they might take to get there. So it's not just about like fantasy, you know, you're fantasizing mm -hmm. some positive thing and, and sitting on your, on your couch mm -hmm. and not doing anything about it. So, yeah. That was, that was called the best self, right? The Imagine best possible yourself. Self. And is that something that, I mean, is that a regular exercise for people to do or you just do it once? Um, it could be regular. You know, we, we didn't find it had a very strong effect. It, it had a significant effect on happiness, but not very strong. I think because it is anything that you do kind of just in your head is hard, uh -huh. including gratitude, by the way. Uh, so, so we find what, what works better is anything that's a little bit more concrete. So like with gratitude, you write, when you write a gratitude letter to someone in your life and actually maybe even share it with them or maybe even not share it with them, but it's, it's more concrete because you're thinking about a person in your life mm -hmm. or acts of kindness. You actually are going out and doing acts of kindness. I mean, that's much more concrete and much more salient and powerful. Mm -hmm. Things that are solely in your head are hard to do. Um, you know, like meditation, right? Lots of people, myself included, like have a hard time learning how to meditate because it's just, it's in your head and you just mm -hmm. you have to sit there and do it. So, but again, I, as I said before, all of these strategies require effort require commitment and you know that's that's the only way that they're going to sort of uh, stick right so the gratitude letter just uh, i just explained for people who haven't read the book and they all should of course it's it's been translated into 22 languages right a bestseller um the um uh you write a letter to someone and, and ideally you go and visit them and read it to them out loud is that right well, Marty Seligman has done studies where he has people write letters and then they actually, you know, like you write a letter to your favorite teacher in high school and then you deliver it, you know, and ideally in person, or, but at least on the phone or something. Um, we don't do our studies that way because it, that, that kind of design confounds a lot of variables. It's basically, if, if that makes you happier, we don't know what piece of it made you happier. Is oh, it writing right. the letter? Or is it going to see this person and having this interaction with them? Um, and we also think, where we're sort of one of my students is studying this is that it actually can be very awkward to share the letter of gratitude mm -hmm. and there are cultural differences in that. Um, so we're, we're studying that right now, actually, we have a study where people are, are expressing gratitude either privately, like to themselves, like I'm really thankful for my mom, or they text their mom and actually text her and say, I'm so thankful for you. So that would be mm -hmm. sharing it or they share it on social media. So on Facebook, they say, Hey, I'm so grateful for my mom. Thank you, mom. And so those, mm -hmm. that, that's sort of the comparison. We, we don't have the data yet, uh, it's still running. Um, so we have to kind of test those pieces separately because mm -hmm. otherwise we don't know. Um, do you have but any... people do report that it's very powerful to actually share the letter. Uh -huh. Do you have any guesses on this experiment? I shouldn't ask you to bias it. But, well, uh... sure. Well, I don't know. I, I guess I would ask you, what, you what, what is your guess? What do you think would be most powerful? Um, 
I think telling the person directly uh, yeah. you know, that would be, I mean, texting them directly or writing them. So, I think so or, too. Or, I think doing it by, or doing it by phone if you're, you know, either way. Uh, and the social media, partly why we're testing is because it's, it happens a lot. And public right. gratitude happens a lot, not just on social media, but imagine at work, there might be an email that goes out to everyone. Hey, I'm so grateful for John for yeah. blah, 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 the great job he did. But that could inspire envy. That could, it's, that, that could be seen as boasting. Um, I don't know. There, there could be some negative effects of that too. Or people may, might think that you're not really grateful. You're just sort of doing impression management. Um, so that's why we're interested in where we have actually a whole line of research where we're interested in digital as opposed to kind of in-person, um, you know, strategy, happiness strategies or social interactions. I think there's something obviously very different when we do things digitally or virtually. Mm -hmm. so, so besides gratitude and acts of kindness and, and positive thinking, then, the, you know, there's another aspect of um, other happiness strategies involved more living in the present and savoring the moment. Is that right? Do you want to talk about them? Yeah, actually, that's one of my, maybe my favorite, actually, is uh, living in the present. Sa well, savoring, uh, savoring basically means extracting the, the um, maximum enjoyment out of something. So like you might be eating your croissant in the morning and you're really savoring it. You're not just sort of busy. You know, sometimes you eat in front of the TV, you, hear, you barely even know you're eating. Mm -hmm. uh, or that cup of coffee or the you take a walk and you're really savoring the chirp of the, the birds or the smell of the flowers or the music that you're listening to or the conversation that you're having. Um, and so I, I think that's so, that's so critical. And in our society, in Western society, especially, we're so busy a lot of the time, we have so many commitments that we're not really truly savoring, you know, because our attention is so important, right? It's all about what you direct your attention to. You mm -hmm. could be having, having the best meal of your life, but not, if you're not really paying attention to how great that meal is, you're not really gonna get much out of it. So. Um, so yeah, I, I think living in the present is, is, is really important. And I, I try to do it myself. It's really hard. You know, I have four kids. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I kind of laugh when I say that because it's, yeah, because it's too many. Um, but <laughs> yeah, so I have a lot of commitments and it's hard to like when I'm with one kid and I, we're talking, I'm thinking about something else. I'm thinking about the orthodontist appointment. I have to take the other kid to or or the, this work thing I have to do. So savoring really means like focusing on what you're, what's in front of you. So how do you do it then? Um, it just takes effort. I mean, it just takes practice. It's not, it's actually not that hard. You just have to tell yourself, you know, focus on what your kid is telling you right now or, or, or mm -hmm. the music you're, you know, it's, it's complementalizing. I mean, people, by the way, people say, people who meditate say that that just is a skill that, that teaches them how to savor and meditate and sort of direct attention in, in various areas of their life. So I guess that's, that would be one guidance that I got guiding, whatever mm -hmm. a recommendation I would give people. And then another way that you talked about is, is a flow experience, right? We're getting so involved in something, right? Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, so flow is very uh, is similar. So Mike Csikszentmihalyi, who is now a professor at Claremont uh, Graduate University, uh, develop this concept of flow, uh, this idea that when, that when you're doing something, you're so absorbed in what you're doing that you lose track of time, you forget you need, you're hungry, you forget you need to go to the bathroom, um, and people who are happier have more, more flow experiences. And they're, they're not necessarily happiness inducing in the moment, although I certainly enjoy them, but like, it's more like after they're over, you kind of, you're like, oh, I was great, you know, so I, I, you know, I could be uh, writing a paper. I, I usually find writing really difficult, but once in a while I really lose myself. I don't know about you, but yeah. where you're in flow and then hours go by. Um, and so that's, that's, it's hard to create that in your life, but it, it does involve focus. It also involves knowing what activities give you flow. One of the exercises that I do with my um, undergraduate students when I teach a class on happiness is for four days, I have them keep track of what they do. I think it's four times a day, like at 10 a.m., you know, 2 p.m., 6 p.m., 10 p.m. And, so, and I ask them, what are you doing? Who are you with? And then what are you feeling? Are you absorbed? You know, are you stressed? Are you happy? Um, and the students tell me that they discover all these things about themselves. Like they discover that they're not in flow when they're, say, watching TV, but they are in flow when they're studying for their, you know, chemistry test um, or, you know, they actually, you know, like you, you find out like there are people that you're with that sort of give you happiness and other people that you spend time with that don't give you happiness. And so I think it's always good to do this kind of me search on yourself, as long as you don't overdo it uh, <laughs> and find out what gives you happiness, what gives you flow. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, I mean, you followed up your first book with uh, the myths of happiness and, and um, 
you know, what are the biggest misconceptions people have? Well, one of the biggest, you know, we talked about hedonic adaptation, the sort of idea that I think we all need to understand that human beings really are good at adapting to things. And so that, that, um, that's important in both the positive and the negative domain. Okay, so in the positive domain, uh, we get married, well, uh, we, uh, we get a new job, we move to a new city and we think like, oh, I'll, I'm gonna be so happy. Like, I'll be happy when all these things happen. But then after they happen, we tend to go back to our previous baseline. Mm-hmm. And so sometimes we misinterpret that and we think, well, maybe this job isn't right for me or maybe this marriage partner isn't right for me, right? Because I'm not as happy as I was before. Mm-hmm. And we have to understand that, that I mean, that's, that could be true. Maybe the job or the spouse isn't right for you, but it could also be, just be hedonic adaptation. And that's just a normal part of living. Um, now, the opposite ca- can happen with the negative domain. Then when bad things happen, when we get a diagnosis that's scary, when we, when we have a loss of income, um, when we lose a friend, we lose a spouse, that we think that we'll never recover. Like we think like, oh, I'm gonna be unhappy forever. And it turns out that human beings are remarkably resilient, right? So we are, we're pretty good, not, not resilient 100%, but we're pretty good at adapting. Mm-hmm. Um, this year has been you know, a pretty tough year for a lot of people. And uh, one of the things that's always interesting to me is that we're just barraged all the time, and before this year, but it's just nonstop bad news. And um, you know, much of it hype, much of it, you know, and it's all basically you know, um, aiming just to get our attention because the easiest way to get that is with bad news. How do you advise people to, to you know, to deal with that? To, to... Yeah, you hear all the time, people are just like obsessed with, they're obsessed with the bad news, but they, and they also are very compelled by them, so they can't help but read them. And then you have, of course, the notifications on your phone, which yeah. we all should turn off our notifications. <laughs> um, but again, I want to get back, and you mentioned this, to, to the concept of attention, which I think is so critical. So one of my favorite quotes of all time is a quote by William James, who's considered the father of psychology and I guess a you know, famous philosopher. And he wrote, my experience is what I agree to attend to. My experience is what I agree to attend to. So basically, it's, it's really a mind boggling quote, because it means that that where we direct our attention to determines our experience. It is our life, right? So I can choose right now to focus on the fight that I had last night with whoever, or on the back pain that I'm having, or I, or on the great day it is, or on, on something optimistic about the, the future. Now, it doesn't mean that we should only focus on positives, but it does mean that we can deliberately choose to direct our attention. And so bad news and is, is just something we can deliberately, we could say, for 45 minutes a day, I'm going to read the, the news and, you know, and kind of uh, give ourselves a deadline or give ourselves a time period uh, or, or not at all. But, but I think we need to be deliberate with our attention. And we hear a lot about how like this is what the big tech companies are fighting over. They're fighting over our attention. And that's something we have control over, where, where we put our attention. But I think curating your news feed is, you know, that, you know, be careful who you follow, be careful what you pay, you know, that attention to. But it's dangerous too, right? Because then we could end up in a bubble, right? If we only look at uh, certain things and ignore others. Yeah, I guess that can be. Um, you've been, um, on a happier topic, you've been doing uh, some work lately on ecstasy, is that right? I do <laughs> Well, ecstasy, which has a deservedly got the name ecstasy, it is a drug called 3,4-methylene-dioxymethamphetamine or MDMA. And it's a drug, it's a psychoactive substance that makes people feel really connected. So when they're on the drug, um, you feel just completely connected, loved, understood, grateful, empathetic, compassionate. And so when I discovered that this this substance has this effect, I thought, oh, what a great drug to use in research where you can, we can try to, we, we, cause we try to, we can try to induce these feelings in the laboratory and study them, right? Because it's kind of hard to induce. Mm-hmm. And so I have, I've only started on this work. Um, there are actually already researchers, psychopharmacologists already who are studying MDMA and other substances, including psychedelics that also make you, make you feel like very connected to sort of all living beings. I mean, cause I'm very interested in connection mm-hmm. as a as sort of a contributor, really as a key to happiness. Um, and so, um, and so my plan is to study MDMA and possibly other, other substances as well, kind of as a, as a tool 
to study connection. And, and what, what, what researchers are finding in the clinical field, so this is called psychedelic medicine, mm -hmm. is that if you give MDMA to people who have uh, post-traumatic stress disorder or other mental health conditions, it could it have really incredible sort of tremendous results, um, mm -hmm. in part because it reduces fear, it makes you more open, less judging, less defensive. Actually, it's really great for the therapeutic alliance, so you can form a bond with a therapist if you do have a PTSD or other conditions. And so, and so there's been like really amazing progress in the psychedelic uh, you know, medicine space. And I would just love to bring ecstasy to social psychology and sort of, and, and other psychedelic and other substances as, as well. As an experimental tool, you mean, basically. As an of course, as an experimental right. tool, yes. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and they're finding that the effects do last beyond the, you know, the temporary. Well, it's, it's actually phenomenal. So in the, again, in clinical medicine, with the clinical, there, there's a, there are now on phase three clinical trials with PTSD and using ecstasy or MDMA with PTSD. And, and they're, they're actually finding that the, um, okay, if I can remember correctly. So with, so they have um, over a hundred treatment, people with treatment resistant PTSD. So they've had it over average, an average of 18 years these are people who've tried everything, nothing works. And I believe after, um, after the study is over, something like 67 something, 60 per plus percent of people no longer meet criteria for PTSD. And a year later, it's a higher, or maybe it's 50 something to 60, it's a higher number. So actually the effects are actually bigger the longer the distance from the, from the, from the treatment, which is yeah. incredible. And, and what the researchers and the clinicians think is that MDMA has this sort of inner healing power. It basically, and, and along with the therapist, you learn kind of how to heal yourself. So, oh. so you're kind of doing this work as you go along. And so, and so with, with connection, there's so many people out there who are lonely. There's a loneliness epidemic, who are oh. isolated or who, are, who have very social deficits. Most mental health conditions have some kind of social deficit. You know, someone once said that the DSM-3, I'm sorry, the DSM, which is the manual of all mental disorders, is basically loneliness in all its many forms. Because <laughs> if you have a mental health condition, you know, you probably are lonely in some way. And it's, it's hard to, you, people don't want to be friends with people who have mental health conditions. And so if we can use MDMA to help even a fraction of people who are lonely, because it turns out you only take it once, two times, or three times to possibly have very durable effects. So I'm not suggesting, or this research is not suggesting that we should be taking ecstasy on a regular basis. Right, right. And, and by the way, antidepressants and other drugs are very powerful substances. Probably, I will, I will say, more harmful than MDMA mm -hmm. uh, in terms of uh, toxicity in the brain. Um, and, people, and people have to take them regularly. You don't just take it right. three times and you're, you know, you're cured. Right. I'm talking about this loneliness epidemic what you know what can someone do who's not taking ecstasy I mean, what you know what sort of exercises can people do to deal with that uh, yeah loneliness it, is it, especially a, today of course with covid right loneliness is such an intractable problem and it's right it's 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 very likely exacerbated by the social isolation that people are feeling and with the distancing um, and researchers have tried different techniques to uh, address loneliness and the problem is you can't just like throw friends at lonely people or throw resources at them John Cassiopo um, was an expert on loneliness who passed away. He has a theory that um, basically describes loneliness as lonely people are very kind of um, vigilant and suspicious of other people's motives, right? So like, why are you trying to act friendly to me? Um, and so the, the, the thought that, that my colleagues and I have had is, is that we should ask lonely people themselves to actually to help others. So, you know, we have a lot of research on pro-social behavior or acts of kindness. And that, and I think if you, if you ask lonely people to be the ones sort of in charge, who have autonomy, who feel competent, that they're sort of reaching out to others, that they might, that that might be a better way to relieve loneliness as opposed to just sort of like throwing friends or, or social support at them. So, so this work is just in the early stages, but that, that's right. what I think we should do. Um, I think the research about need to belong, that that's really this basic human drive that, you know, that we need to do it. And I remember one researcher said, I met a lot of people who, who say they have no friends. I've never met anyone who didn't want to have friends. Uh, you know, exactly. But, I mean, they need to belong, as you know. This is Roy Baumeister, your, your collaborator, and, and Mark Leary. The, this is one of the most cited papers of all time in our field. And, you know, just sort of showing that it's just, it's maybe the most important human need that we have. And, and with COVID, you know, there's a lot of talk about that, right? That we, 
we need to feel, and at first there was a sense that we were all in it together, like the entire world is facing the same problem, right? When does that ever happen? Even world wars didn't hit like every you know, country in the world. Um, mm -hmm. So we kind of felt like we're all in it together, we're all in the same boat. Um, but on the other hand, if we don't feel like we belong in our community, in our neighborhood, in our school, in our organization, in our country, then that's a that's very aversive, right? And that you know that's very toxic. It's tough. Um, what's going on in your research now in the field? What are some of the of the new ideas or the things that are be you know the next thing to, to come along in happiness research that excite mm. you? Wow. There's so much. I mean, not not just in my lab, but I mean now there's a lot, there's neuroscience of, of of happiness, right? And so looking at people's brains and see what you know when what happy people are like, uh, and or doing when they're engaging in different kinds of activities. Um, you know, economists are, are of course are, are interested in happiness. Um, in terms of my own lab, I mean, I, I mentioned some of the work uh, to you. I mean, I think mo most, what I'm most interested in right now, well, I don't want to say most, I mean, the two, two, two of the things I'm int very interested in, one is connection, as we talked about. I really think that feeling connected to others is what makes life worth living, and sort of how do we promote connection. Uh, I'm a big fan of um, Harry Reese and his theory. So Harry is a professor at University of Rochester. Mm -hmm. And he has a theory uh, about relationships called partner responsiveness. Mm -hmm. And what he argues is that the key to relationships is to be a responsive partner. And that is to make your partner feel understood, valued, and loved or cared mm -hmm. for. Understood, yeah. valued, and loved. And at first I thought, oh, that makes sense. It almost seems obvious, right? When you first hear about it. But the more you think about it, the more you realize how powerful that is. And especially the understood part. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've talked to a lot of people who are happily married and they'll say, my wife or my husband loves me, you know, values me, but doesn't really understand me. You know, she never really understood me. And so how do you get people to feel understood? One way, well, the, the best way is you have to show authentic interest in them. So I'm really interested in this. How do you show authentic interest in someone? And I would say, and Harry would say, that everyone has something about them that should be authentically interesting to you, even though you might not agree. I mean, I've certainly been to like, I go to a lot of kids' birthday parties mm -hmm. and I'm forced to talk to the other parents. And sometimes I'm like, I don't find them interesting at all. Mm -hmm. But I think, no, you know what? There must be something about this person that's interesting. And you can't fake it, right? You can't fake yeah. it. You have to ask questions and, mm -hmm. and, and really truly be interested and then the other really key feature is self-disclosure. And, mm -hmm. and you need to open yourself up at least a little bit to the other person. Now, it doesn't have to be sharing your deepest secrets. It needs to, the dosage needs to be perfect, right? Mm -hmm. You don't want to over-disclose. You don't want to disclose too much at the wrong time. Mm -hmm. But if we don't, if we're closed off, we don't share, you know, open ourselves a little bit, make ourselves a little bit vulnerable, then we're not going to truly be able to understand other people. And no one, and you can't be understood, right? If I'm not... If I don't disclose anything about myself, I'll never feel understood, right? Because how can anyone understand me if I'm not showing my true self to others? Mm -hmm. So I'm very interested in, in this theory and in how to get people to feel more connected by getting themselves and others to feel more understood and validated and loved. That's really interesting. One of my favorite findings and that I found incredibly useful was a simple exercise. When your partner tells you something that happened to them good, you should just make sure that you celebrate it. I mean, all you have to do is say, I mean, that's great. Tell me more about it. Just that simple little thing. And I've noticed people who do this, you know, that it makes such a difference to the other person. You feel understood, you feel validated. That instead of saying, oh, that's great, and just and changing the subject, you know, you just, you know, just that little thing makes a huge difference, I think. Absolutely. And that actually, that's called capitalizing. And yeah. that comes out of Harry Reese's lab as right, well, right. Kelly Gable. Right, because you, you have to really show enthusiasm and ask lots of questions. Well, what, was that, what did you feel like when you heard that news? Or what are you going to do now? Mm -hmm. And we don't do that often enough. We don't ask each other questions. I mean, I tell my kids, like, it's very easy to talk to people. Just ask them a lot of questions. Everyone likes to talk about themselves. Exactly. And, and ask them questions and actually be interested in the answers. Yeah. I want to mention one, sorry, I want to mention one more thing that I'm really interested in, uh -huh. which is digital. I mean, I kind of alluded to this face-to-face -face versus digital interactions and what's mm -hmm. better and what makes us happiest. I think that's a huge question for our times, mm -hmm. both because of COVID, because now we're all like this across the screen, but since whatever, 2008 or so, 2009 when smartphones came out. Uh, and so we're doing studies where we're comparing like the sense of connection people have when they're texting as opposed to face-to-face -face versus, you know, on a video call or on the phone. What are you finding? Well, um, 
mostly that face-to-face -face is better, but we have one study where we asked people to engage in more social interactions or to be kind to others. And we actually found no differences between face-to-face -face video and phone. Really? So those three people felt very connected. And then, then text and social, social media was at the bottom uh, mm -hmm. in terms of the sense of connection. Mm -hmm. um, but I really feel like, you know, human beings were not hardwired to interact, you know, over, over Zoom, uh, right? Like we miss the, vi we miss the nonverbal cues. We don't have touch. We don't have smell, you know, we, um, you know, the voice, we don't get quite as, quite as well. Right. So I, I think we try, and the more we can increase face-to-face -face interactions, the better, I think, although mm -hmm. it's very challenging today. Mm -hmm. Well, um, the, um, I think we have some questions now, maybe from you know from the audience. I think that. that um... Yes, we have a ton of great questions. This is a fascinating discussion. Um, so great, thanks to you both. Our first question is: um, What do you think of Kelly McGonigal's work um, of Har of uh, Stanford? Um, her work on the deep biochemical relationship between physical movement and happiness. Uh, you know, I know Kelly a little bit. I don't know the work very well, so I'm gonna I'm gonna have to pass on that question. But there definitely is a connection between mind and body. So I, I, you know, I think there's there's a clear connection there. But I'm just gonna pass on any any detailed comments. Okay, we have ton of, tons of other questions there. Um, how would you describe the interconnection between happiness? and resilience. For example, would you say the happy you, happy you are, the more resilient you are, or the more unhappy you are, the less resilient you are? Absolutely, there's a correlation, there's, there's a, quite a bit of correlational evidence that show that happier people are more resilient. And resilience basically is the ability to bounce back after adversities or stresses or tragedies. Um, now it is a correlation, so it could be that you know, being resilient just makes you happy, right? When I'm, if I'm resilient, I'm like, that's going to make me happy to be resilient. Um, but there's some longitudinal work like Bar by Barb Fredrickson and others that show that, that when you have more positive emotions, when you're happier, that leads to you, for you to be more resilient later when sort of a negative event hits. Like Fredrickson did a study be uh, looking at people before and after 9-11, and she found that people who experienced more positive emotions before 9-11 were more resilient after that event. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, how can adjusting one's expectations affect one's happiness? Are there techniques for making those adjustments stick? It's a great question. When we were talking about the hedonic treadmill or hedonic adaptation, something I didn't really know, mention, well, what are the mechanisms by which, why is it that we adapt? And one reason we adapt to life changes is because our expectations adjust, right? So. So we might have a loss of income or an increase in income. And after a while, our expectations kind of become higher or lower, and then we, and then we adapt. And so some people think that expectations are really, really critical. In fact, one of my favorite theories of why uh, people in Denmark are, tend to be the happiest country um, is that there was this great paper, and it, the title was something like Danish people have lower expectations. Um, <laughs> and so, now, I would, so I wouldn't say that, that we should all lower our expectations, but I think we need to kind of be aware of that expectations are so critical. Um, I mean, I, I'm kind of a fan of defensive pessimism, which is that you sort of, you, you hope for the best, but you kind of prepare for the worst. You know, you don't think like before a big exam or a big presentation at work, don't think I'm gonna nail it, like, cause that will lead you to work less hard to prepare. So you prepare better. Um, so I don't have a lot of advice about how to adjust expectations. I think that's like a really, that's like a billion dollar question. Um, but again, just be aware that expectations are critical and that you want to, you know, kind of assess them and, you know, try to try to modify them. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Um, is there an impact on your happiness if you surround yourself with happy people? Mm -hmm. There is. And in fact, there's uh, at least one study I can think of. I think it was done by Christakis at... Uh, that found that people who are happier just have more happier people sort of around them, like different social, if you look at the social network uh, and different degrees of separation. Um, now that's, again, that's correlational. So again, it could just be, right, it could just be that, I mean, I think both, both directions are true, right? If I'm happier, I'm gonna be drawn to happier people. I'm gonna maybe, you know, be more likely to choose happier friends. 
but then having people or happy people around me are going to kind of boost my happiness. By the way, this is also true with obesity, with smoking, with income. People tend to surround themselves with those who are like them. And it's, it looks like there's a causal duration, relationship both ways. So uh, anyway, the short answer is yes. Great. Uh, how does moderate alcohol use affect happiness? Uh, wow, I don't know any research on alcohol use and happiness. Lots of research on alcohol use and, and health, which probably the, the, the question is referring to that moderate alcohol use is associated with actually better health than, than no alcohol at all. Uh, but I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I guess that's, there's a dissertation out there waiting to be written on alcohol use and happiness. Mm -hmm. Okay, this one's a long one. Um, do you find differences in happiness among genders? I'm very interested in women in particular. You mentioned having children, and we all know children interrupt flow, make life busy, and for the care and for the caregiver can make life lonely by making it more difficult to connect or find time to connect with others other than your children. Um, this person recently had five girlfriends over and through their conversation that evening, it turned out that all of them were taking some form of anti-anxiety medicines. That was a great question. So first, I just want to mention that um, overall, there are no gender differences in happiness, but there are differences in um, kind of the lability of happiness. So women tend to kind of go a little bit up and down. Men are a little bit more stable. So women have higher highs and lower lows. Um, we don't find gender differences in our intervention research, but we have a whole line um, led by my former student, Katie Nelson, about parenthood and happiness. And there are, gender, in fact, we just published a study on gender differences in parenthood. So basically what we find is that um, fathers are happier than men without children, but mothers are not happier with me than women without children. And so again, this is a correlation so lots of things go into that. Uh, we, we think, I mean, one, one I guess obvious explanation is kind of related to what the, the questioner was, was mentioning that, you know, women have a lot more, they tend to do the kind of the grunt work, more of the responsibilities of childcare. Uh, fathers have been found to be more, spend more time in play with their children uh, more, and more time working. Um, I mean, it's, I mean, parenthood is hard for everyone, <laughs> both mothers and fathers, but but um, um, so it could be, that could be the explanation. We also find that actually what's interesting is that the particularly unhappy group are actually the men without children, the childless men. So there may be more of a interesting explanation there. Um, but we have a paper about the uh, sort of happiness and parenthood and, and basically the answer, like are parents happier than people who don't have kids is the answer is it depends. It depends on many, many factors. Uh, and also the gender differences it affects. So if they're, by the way, if anyone is interested, um, my website, sonialubomirsky.com <laughs> um, has all my papers on there that you can download for free. So, um, so yeah, so it's all in there. That's great. Can you discuss the role of humor in happiness? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know much about, I mean, I, yeah, humor does play a role in happiness. There's a correlation between humor and happiness. Um, um, I don't know much about, there's not a lot of research on it. There is a professor at University of Zurich who is an expert on humor, probably, you know, maybe one of the few people who does research in, in humor in our field. It's, it's a little hard to study, you know? Um, so, um, so yeah, I don't know much about it other than to say that there is a correlation. Um, and certainly, you know, anecdotally, you know, I think it's humor, it's great to have in our lives and we should all tr try to laugh as much as we can. Just as an aside, I was once asked to do one of those laughing things where I was doing a webinar and the group said, okay, now we do this laughter, you know, like we just kind of force yourself to laugh. And mm -hmm. I thought that was like, I'm like, oh my God, I don't want to do this. That was ridiculous. And, but you have to, you have to do it anyway. Like imagine right now, everyone on this call, like just laugh. And at first you're just, you just feel ridiculous because you're laughing for no reason, but then you just find it funny that you're laughing for no reason. And then other people, you find other people funny. So you end up, actually end up really laughing heartily. And it, it kind of made my day, that little exercise. So I, I guess I would say I recommend that. That's great. Uh, you mentioned that connection is important. Do you believe that kids and teens who play a lot of video games are disconnected and therefore less happy overall? Um, 
there's a book by Jean Twenge called iGen, which I really recommend to people. And it's about teenagers and um, digital media use and social media and video games. And there's a lot of correlational evidence that she shows that teens who spend more time on digital media and less time face to face. So it could be a not really the fault of the screen use, but the fault that you're doing. You're not, you're not playing sports, you're not spending time with your parents or your friends. <clears throat> They're less happy, and especially this is true for teen girls, okay? So teen girls have lower self-esteem, more anxiety, more depression, more suicide, suicidality if they spend more time on screens and especially social media. Now, video games are actually an interesting exception. It turns out that there's either a small or really no correlation between video game use and happiness. And it's partly because it's more boys that play video games. Um, and also some of them, a lot of them are social, right? Because you're playing with like other avatars or whatever, other people. Um, so, so, but anyway, that, but Twangy really lays out all the data if, if anyone's interested. Great. Um, what is the difference between joy and happiness? Um, I think this is a, really a semantic question. Uh, depends on how you define them. Um, joy is usually used to, as a, uh, to define a positive emotion that's transient, right? So you might experience joy for a moment or a few moments, maybe a few minutes. It's not something you experience for like two hours, maybe, but it's just really, it's a, it's a short-term transient emotion. Happiness is usually used to, to um, refer to something um, longer term, um, either like almost like a trait, some people are happier than others. Um, or yeah, so so yeah. So it sort of depends on how you define them. So I would just say joy is really uh, it's a part of happiness because because positive emotions are a hallmark of being a happy person. Happy people experience more positive emotions in their daily life, including joy, including tranquility, including pride, affection. Um, you know, all, all those other positive emotions. Mm -hmm. I love that we're getting to ask you all these questions. Um, here's another one. Um, what would you recommend for folks who have low subjective well-being during the pandemic? Mm -hmm. Okay, so low subjective, so subjective well-being, again, is a, just another word for happiness. Uh, I just think of it sort of as a jargon kind of term for happiness. So basically the findings with, with the pandemic, and I've been looking at some of the literature, most people are doing just fine, but a subset, any, somewhere between 15% and 30% are not doing well, right? They are having low subjective well-being. 15% are experiencing quite severe mental health challenges as a cause, as a, looks like as a cause of the pandemic. Um, what I would say is kind of the same thing we've been talking about this whole hour, uh, the same strategies apply. I mean, I think connection is really critical. Don't, you know, not to be isolated, to get social support from others, uh, interact with others as much as you can, connect, you know, help others. Again, take, take the um, attention off of yourself when you're unhappy and, and direct it to someone else who might be even worse off. Um, gratitude is a little bit harder to engage in when you're really unhappy, right? Because maybe you really don't have much, maybe you've lost your job or you really have little to be happy for. Um, but the same kind of strategies that we talked about that help people at any time of life are gonna help uh, during the pandemic, I think. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, our last question is this one. Um, do you have any data on intergenerational connection and happiness, for example, between elders and teens? Mm -hmm. No, I do not. I do not. But again, I think that all kinds of connection is important. Connection to the people closest to us is probably even more important because it, they, it takes a lot of, of our energy and time and our you know, mental kind of space. Um, and so I would, I would guess that, that kind of co the intergenerational connection is really critical. Um, mm -hmm. It's sort of what makes us happy, right, is our families and our friends. Um, so yeah, I mean, I like to, I guess, end on that, on that note again, that the importance of relationships and the importance of feeling connected and feeling like we belong um, to our happiness. That's great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you, John. Um, thanks to our audience for all of the great questions. This can, concludes our summer of programming. Uh, if you missed any of our events or want to refer to them again, you can find them on aspeninstitute.org slash community. Um, all of our events this summer were free and open to the public. So if you are in a position to, to donate, please click on the link in the chat. Thank you so much for joining us.